We Americans, whether rightly or wrongly, are proud of our democratic tradition. We don't have a simple democracy. We have a representative democracy, what our framers would have called a republic. And in a republic, it is the majority who is to win. A republic is majoritarian. But other nations, at important points in their past, have not been majoritarian. South Africa, before the end of apartheid. Liberia, under the control of African-American nationals. Iraq, with Sunnis and Ba'athist Iraq. Syria, with the Alawites. Rwanda, with the Tutsis. These nations, at those moments, were not majoritarian. They were minoritarian. They had systems that protected a minority, that gave the minority a power to rule over the majority. That made them minoritarian. Okay, so the simple idea I want to convey to you in the couple minutes that I'll have your attention here is that whatever the United States has been, the United States is becoming a minoritarian nation. Now, you might hear that and say, becoming? Women didn't have the right to vote in America until just early in the last century. African Americans, halfway through the century before, the populists for much of American history had no right to vote. And even today, immigrants have no right to vote and most teens have no right to vote. You could say America has always been a minoritarian nation and in that sense, it is true. But I mean something different here. I mean among those we say should count among citizens, among voters, among those, America is becoming a minoritarian nation. And this, I wanna argue, is new. Okay, here's what I mean. The American government is divided into four critical institutions. Congress is divided between a Senate and a House. The executive is ruled by a president. And the judiciary is governed by a Supreme Court. Together, these institutions have built a precariously majoritarian representative democracy. Here's why it's precarious. Think about the efficiency of a vote in our democracy. And by that, I just mean how popular votes translate into political power. So if a vote is 100% efficient, it perfectly translates into political power. If it's less than 100% efficient, it's not perfectly translating into political power. So the House of Representatives is the closest we have to a perfectly efficient democratic institution. Over the past 20 years, Democrats have achieved a 97% efficiency, while Republicans have achieved 103%, meaning for every vote they get, they get more than that in effective political representation. The presidency is a little less efficient. In the period 1796 to 2020, the democracy has succeeded 89% of the time, meaning 89% of the time the winner of the popular vote has been selected as the president. The current Supreme Court is much less democratically efficient. Five of the current justices um, were appointed by presidents who were not selected by the popular vote in their first term, which means we have a 44% democratic efficiency in the Supreme Court. And certainly the worst institution for democratic efficiency is the United States Senate. Between 2000 and 2020, the Democrats had a 95% efficiency in the United States Senate, and the Republicans likewise had 103%, meaning their votes mattered more. But even more important, because the Senate has two senators per state, and states are wildly different in their population, that means that a small proportion of America has the effective ability to block what the majority of the people in America might want. Now in 1790, what that meant is that states representing 26% of the population had the capacity to block legislation in the Senate. But those numbers have only gotten worse. In 2010, it was states representing just 18% of the American population who could block what the United States Senate did. And when you count the filibuster, in 2010, states representing just 12% of the American population would have the capacity to block the United States Senate 
from passing legislation that the House has passed and that the president would have signed. So if you look at that system, you say, it, if it's majoritarian, it certainly was precariously majoritarian. And we can see some of that precariousness, too, in the 2020 election. In the 2020 election, if you look at the votes for Democrats in every one of the major Democratic institutions, the Democrats achieved a majority. They got more votes than Republicans in the House, more votes than Republicans in the Senate, and more votes than Republicans for the presidency. And indeed, the system awarded control to the Democrats in each of those three institutions. But with the presidency, it was extremely precarious. Though Joe Biden beat Donald Trump by more than 7 million votes, if just 26,000 votes in three states had gone for Donald Trump, Donald Trump could have been elected president in the House of Representatives. So if America is a majoritarian republic, it is a precariously majoritarian republic. At least that has been our past. Okay, but here's the thing. If we've been precariously majoritarian, I fear we're about to become minoritarian because of changes that are happening right now. So consider what we could call the techniques of minoritarianism. The first technique is vote suppression. After this last election where an extraordinary number of people voted because of techniques that enabled everybody to participate easily, states across the country are beginning to impose restrictions on the freedom to vote to make it harder for Democrats to vote than for Republicans. The New York Times reports over 200 bills are now being considered in legislatures across the country. Number two, gerrymandering. Because of the way politicians draw districts and because 2020 triggers a new redistricting cycle, in this new cycle, because Republicans control more state houses, the Republicans will be able to gerrymander those districts to produce majority control when they only have the minority of the votes. As the New York Times reports, the GOP could retake the House in 2020 based solely on the gains from newly drawn districts. And then number three, something we've never seen in American history, what we could call faithless legislature laws. States are considering laws that would give the legislature the power to flip the results in a presidential election if the legislature doesn't like who the people voted for. If we were precarious, this precariousness is ending, but not in a good way. This precariously majoritarian democracy is becoming predictably minoritarian. Now, elsewhere in other countries, you might expect the judiciary to step in. Elsewhere, the courts would step in and demand representational equality in the face of these types of changes. Ours has, at least historically, in 1963, the Supreme Court declared against a system that benefited some minority over the majority, a principle of one person, one vote, constraining how legislatures might have the power to muck about with this principle of majoritarianism. But this Supreme Court has been very different. It has never resisted this slide to minoritarianism. It has upheld ID rules that disproportionately burden Democrats. It has upheld unequal access rules that disproportionately burden Democrats. And it has upheld partisan gerrymandering, which disproportionately burdens Democrats. It is only ever accelerated minoritarian rule in the series of decisions about money in speech, the Supreme Court has upheld the power of the rich to participate in our political system more powerfully than the rest of us. It has entrenched the power of money over the people, meaning it has entrenched minoritarian democracy, at least when it comes to money in politics. I think we have to accept the judges won't save us here. And so the question is, who could? Well, the most obvious institution that could save us from this minoritarianism is the United States Congress. And indeed, right now, Congress is considering a statute called H.R. 1, For the People Act, which is the most important democratic reform in two generations to have passed the House of Representatives. What H.R. 1 would do is 
not address the Electoral College because Congress doesn't have that power directly, and it can't address the Senate because the power of the Senate is entrenched in the Constitution. But it radically reduces the capacity of states to suppress the votes of disfavored political parties, and it ends partisan gerrymandering, meaning everyone would have an equal freedom to vote in districts that were drawn not for partisan advantage. And most importantly to me, it changes the way money affects politics, giving politicians the capacity to run their campaigns without depending upon the tiny few to fund their campaigns. It does that and so much more. This would be the most important change we've seen, radically entrenching the ideals of majoritarian democracy. But here's the catch. For H.R. 1 to pass, it must pass the United States Senate. And to pass the United States Senate, given the filibuster rule, it needs 60 votes. So that means we need a super majority to secure majoritarianism in America. In this sense, we've produced a minoritarian nation. In this sense, America is a rock. Okay, so that's a depressing story. And if bad science fiction is to be believed, then perhaps this hopelessness is a reason for hope. You say we're on the brink of destruction, and you're right. But it's only on the brink that people find the will to change. Only at the precipice do we evolve. Only at the precipice. If the Senate can end the filibuster and pass H.R. 1, then we will have evolved in America. If not, then I fear that this list of minoritarian nations needs one more added to the list, the United States, for no good reason and at great loss to the whole of the world.